Hello and welcome back. So I covered team defense metrics a few days ago in the fantasy goaltending video. And as I mentioned in that video, you can usually use the team level data to help you make better decisions about your goaltending. If you missed that video, I highly encourage you to check it out as it can help you fix your fantasy goaltending if you've been struggling with this so far in the season. Now today, we're gonna look at team level offensive data from November 29th. That's what I've been working on for the past few days. Uh, and we'll start to see some trends and things that you can potentially use for fantasy hockey. Now, when it comes to the offensive data, the way to use this knowledge is to apply it to anybody that you're thinking about adding off the wire. And I get this question a ton. Data draft, who should I pick up off the wire, player X or player Y? And in terms of a nightly stream, I may take that question and see how player X and player Y perform against the team that they're playing that night, and then use that to make an informed decision about which guy to choose. But, uh, And that's what I did with Jeff Skinner last week uh, against Montreal. I looked at how he was performing against the Canadians in general. He was about a point per game, uh, and he had bro a broken out for a five-point game before. So I said, hey, go look at Jeff Skinner for Tuesday night, and then he sure enough went off for five points. But for longer term holds, I'd rather look at team level data. And you think of uh, a team as a garden and your fantasy player is a fruit plant. If you plant your plant in a barren wasteland, it's not going to grow at all. It's not going to produce any fruit for you. If you put it in a normal backyard garden, it will produce some fruit. But if you put it in a fertile oasis that's nurtured and watered, then you're going to get a lot more fruit out of it. In fantasy, in terms of that, uh, if a team is scoring four goals per game, the, the chances of the waiver ad that you're picking up that will produce are obviously better than an equivalent player on a team that's only scoring 2.5 goals per game. Now, it's probabilities mixed with the data, and that's where I can help. Uh, so let's dive right into it. This graph is a visualization I've done of teams goals for per game with the data obtained from moneypuck.com. And I've overlaid this data with the current league standings because the two go hand in hand. So notice at the top, Boston scoring four goals per game. They are number one in the league. Uh, New Jersey is third best in goals for, they're second in the league. The Stars, second best in goals for, sixth in the league. And it also works in reverse as well. So Arizona, third worst in goals for, fifth worst in the league. Anaheim, third worst in goals for, uh, they're last in the league. And then Chicago, second worst in both. So this, the first interesting thing that you see on this chart is Carolina way down at the bottom here, uh, fifth worst in goals for at 2.682. But they are ninth in the league standings with 29 points in 23 games. Um, so in terms of goals against, they are eighth best in the league at 2.74. So their goal differential isn't that negative, And that may explain why they're so high in the standings. Uh, Carolina, however, is dead last in the league in terms of team shooting percentage. And they're pretty low on the power play as well, as we'll see in an upcoming slide. And we'll go into the Carolina case file in more detail when we get to that. But that's uh, one of the anomalies of the data. And that's something that you could potentially use to mine fantasy value, as we'll see in the future. Now, you also see Nashville down below Carolina, fourth worst in the league in goals for uh, and they're fourth worst in the league in terms of shooting percentage at 8.5%. And it's the same type of phenomenon that we'll cover in just a minute. Now, in terms of fantasy ads, what you want to take away from this chart, the players that are on the waiver wire that you can access uh, are coming. You want access to the guys that are coming from the teams at the top, Boston, Dallas, New Jersey, Buffalo, Vancouver, Seattle, Tampa, Colorado, all these teams at the top, they're going to give you a better uh, overall exposure to uh, offensive players, to uh, you know a team that's performing well right now as opposed to a team that's struggling. Um, so you definitely want guys from those teams and you specifically want guys that are in their top six and playing for their PP units, whether it's PP1 or PP2, depending on how they roll them out. Now, there are a few ownable options from each of these teams. So let's take a quick look. Now, the best of the top four teams is David Krejci. He's still only 24% owned for some reason, despite 18 points in 19 games, uh, eight on the power play, and he's firmly entrenched in the top six. Uh, he does see some power play time in Boston. He used to be on PP1. He's not uh, currently listed on PP1, but that's an option that they always have is to move him up with the top guys. Boston's averaging four goals a game, and he's currently playing with Pavel Zaka and David Pasternak, according to Daily Faceoff. Um, Zaka's on this list as well. He's also available at only 3% ownership. He's three position eligible, which does make him a little bit more fantasy relevant. And he's got 15 points in 22 games, but averaging over two shots per game, 
which is a bit higher than David Krejci. But either of these guys are, you know, both in the top six. Uh, Krejci sees a little bit more power play time. Zaka sees a little bit here and there. Um, but you can obviously see Krejci has more power play points. Now, as we move to Dallas, they're very top line heavy. Uh, Robertson, Hintz, Pavelski are one of the top three best lines in the league. But their second line, Faxa, is uh, currently centering it with Sagan and Marchment. Now, Marchment is the choice here, as Faxa only has five points in 23 games, so he's really not fantasy relevant. But Marchment, 13 points in 23 games is not that bad, 2.3 goal, uh, shots per game, sorry, and 1.2 hits per game. So not quite as prolific in those departments as he was in Florida, but he's probably the best option in this ownership range. Now, the third line in Dallas does see some power play two time. Uh, and they're way, way more available on the waiver wire without a huge drop off in point production. So Ty Delandria, 2% owned, four goals, nine assists, 30 shots, 30 hits, 15 blocks. So nice uh, category coverage there. Uh, about one, a little bit more than one per game for uh, most of these. Wyatt Johnston, um, he's getting a little bit more power play time. He's got two power play points on the year, six goals, three assists, 41 shots. Um, and he's only 1% owned. So both of these guys are available. Then you look at the Devils. Uh, in New Jersey, Dawson Mercer is playing with Eric Halla and Jack Hughes. And Hughes is on fire right now. Um, but Mercer's only 18% owned. And he's got 14 points in 23 games. Four of those on the power play. And he was averaging two shots per game and getting a couple blocks as well. Uh, he's a guy that does get the most power play time out of all of these guys. So he's maybe the guy that you're going to want to target out of this bunch. But then you also have Thomas Tatar, who's playing with Nico Heischer. He's only 16% owned, six goals, nine assists, 45 shots, getting some hits and blocks as well. Eric Halla, I just mentioned, is playing with Hughes and Mercer. 13% owned, nine points, uh, very assist heavy, but does get some shot volume. Uh, as well. And then you also have Yegor Sharangovich, who sometimes floats into the top six as well. Eight goals on the year, so highest of the bunch. And then six assists, 46 shots as well. And he's only 10% owned. So these guys are all dual position eligible at the very least, and they're all getting a, a nice uh, opportunity in an offense that is performing uh, top three in the league right now. So that's kind of what you want to look for. And then with Buffalo, I mentioned this in the week eight video. Um, one of their hottest lines right now is Cousins, Paterka, and Quinn. And they've been having a really nice week since I shouted them out on Sunday. Um, and they're probably all available for you on the waiver wire. Their ownership is still not that high. 22% for Cousins, 17% for Olofsson, who's not on that line, 9% for Quinn, and 2% for Paterka. So um, all these guys are readily available. Olofsson does get a little bit more power play time, four power play points on the year. Um, Casey Middlestat, surprisingly nine points on the power play. So he's getting some power play time as well. Only 6% owned. Uh, so that's not a bad option either. Um, but as I mentioned before this week, Cousins is on the first power play unit. He's got three power play points on the year, but 18 points in 23 games. And then a pretty healthy shot volume, pretty close to three shots per game uh, compared to the other two guys. So this is kind of how you can use the data to mine some fantasy value. Now, not all these players uh, are going to work with what you have already on your team. You kind of have to see what you're looking for uh, and then potentially, you know, build it. If you need goals and power play production, you'd probably go for a guy like Olofsson, 11 goals, get some power play time, and they come in bunches for him, as I've mentioned several times before. If you need a winger option with some positional flexibility, maybe you go Jack Quinn. He had a nice shootout winner the other night. That doesn't count for fantasy but he also is playing with uh, Cousins and Paterka, and that line's playing really well. But the moral of this is that there are some guys in the top six on some of the best offensive teams in the league that are available. And in terms of uh, probability of production for your team, they may be a better bet for your fantasy team than a guy like Seth Jarvis, who may or may not be a better player than some of these guys, and he may be on a better team, but they have a horrible offense right now, and he's not producing like some of these guys. Now, speaking of Carolina and Jarvis, this is a graph of the goals for per game differential between last year and this year. So last year, some teams were scoring a lot more than they are now, and we're seeing some teams score a lot more than last year as well, which may change the mentality of navigating the waiver wire and trade offers. So if, as you look at this, St. Louis is the worst offender. They're almost a goal per game worse than they were last year. Last year, 3.77 goals per game. This year, 2.81 uh, and there aren't really any logical answers as to why. They had almost no turnover from year to year. The same top nine that were labeled one of the best in the league last year uh, 
for whatever reason, the production has dried up. And that may indicate that they're due to regress upward towards the mean and their gold production from here on out may increase. Uh, but it also may tell you to stay away from the deeper blues waiver options until they start to figure this out. Um, and they are a team that uses two power play units. So that's a little bit more rare than some of these other teams. So you see Justin Falk as a potential power play option. You see um, Tory Krug as a potential power play option. And they both kind of get equal time because they, they quarterback separate units. So that's something to look out for as well. If one unit gets hot, then maybe that guy uh, quarterbacking the power play or that unit, if, uh, if you can maybe Ryan O'Reilly's on one of the units and he's not that owned up, you can usually uh, try to find out that information. And that's a, a great place uh, to find it is the, our Discord group in the description below, uh, in the Patreon uh, link in the description below. But the Minnesota Wild are apparently missing Kevin Fiala a lot this year. They're second worst in this metric in terms of how much they've regressed from last season. Um, they lost 0.81 goals per game. Last year, they were 3.72 goals for, this year 2.9, uh, and their goals against has gone down as well, which kind of explains why their record is 20th in the league and they're outside of a playoff spot. Now, I'll give you uh, an example of a question that I got from a YouTube comment today, and they asked which player would have a better shot for the rest of the season to produce, uh, Matt Zuccarello or Alex Tuck? And I showed them this exact graph and how Minnesota is way down in terms of scoring and how Buffalo is at the opposite end of the spectrum, way up in scoring, almost by the same exact amount. Uh, and then I showed them each player's stats and projections for the rest of the year and c concluded that Tuck may be the better option given the trends and Tuck's category coverage. And that's an, a prime example of how you can use this data to make better determinations on waiver pickups and trades as well, because likely both of those guys are owned up and that's a trade offer that's coming the, the way of the person who asked the question. Um, but either way, this is how you can kind of tell, do I want a player on a really bad struggling offense or do I want a player who's on a really hot offense right now? Um, there may be room for regression, you know, in both cases back closer to the mean, um, but sometimes, uh, you know, it's better to, to pick on the guy that's hot and just ride that wave. Not necessarily that the guy's hot because Tuck is playing well, but the team is on fire as well. And their power play, as we'll see in an upcoming slide, is a uh, very prolific uh, top 10 in the league right now. So just again, if you want access to these visualizations, you can go to the Patreon link in the description below and get all of these for just $3 a month and refer to them to yourself on a regular basis to make more informed decisions about your waiver ads and trade offers. But one thing we have to use these charts for is projecting forward what might happen in the future as I just described. And the best predictor that I've found for that purpose is on this next chart. What we have here is team expected goals versus actual goals for. And we just went over, you want to add players on teams with potent offenses, but some potent offenses just aren't finishing right now, and they're potentially about to break out with a bit more puck luck. So that's what you're looking at in red at the bottom. Teams like Nashville, Carolina, Ottawa, Florida, the Rangers, these are all teams that are getting high quality chances to score, and they're just not finishing on their chances, and they have the talent to finish. So some of these teams uh, that are towards the bottom, maybe they don't have the talent to finish. Philadelphia doesn't really have it right now. They're riddled with injuries. Pittsburgh just lost Chris Letang. Maybe they don't have it right now, and their power play is inexplicably low right now. Uh, some of these teams, Chicago doesn't have a ton to work with, but some of these teams at the bottom here do have a lot to work with, and they're just not finishing their chances. Um, so this could potentially explain why Nashville's middling a bit, why the Rangers are off to a slower start, why Florida isn't scoring like they were last year, but it can also be a place to mine some fantasy value. Now, if you have a player like Sam Bennett, Sam Reinhart, maybe Debrinkit or Batherson, maybe Duchesne, Johansson, some of these guys I've been getting asked about pretty regularly, and some of them are not great options. I've never really liked Duchesne or Johansson, but can it really be this bad for the entire season? There's 17 goals below expected, and at some point, the regression to the mean should happen. And it's impossible to say whether this increase in goals will come from those two guys, uh, but they're going to get the bulk of the opportunities. Um, conversely, can the Canucks sustain this level of production? There's 17 goals above expected. Uh, what about the Kraken, who are way up here in second place at 10 above expected? What about Detroit? There are two factors that go into this other than this metric, and that is shooting percentage and power play percentage. 
And in terms of fantasy, the Canucks have Kuzmenko, who's 50% owned, and Besser, who's 60% owned, getting some uh, production, factoring in on the power play. The Kraken have most of their guys under 50% ownership, despite this surprisingly powerful offense. And people are kind of already on the Detroit offense as they're mostly owned up, but they are less likely to regress as they're only about six goals above expected, unlike Vancouver, who's 17 goals above. But let's take a look at shooting percentage uh, first. Now, basically, if a team has a higher shooting percentage, there's more of a chance that they'll stop scoring and start regressing back to the mean. If the percentage is lower, they may regress upward and start scoring goals any day now. Now, it's impossible to tell when that will happen, but it's very similar to the expected versus actual goals in terms of spotting trends before others do. Before others can realize what's going on, you'll already have the data and you'll know. Now, to answer the question of whether or not some of these teams can keep it up, Seattle is likely not going to score at this pace all year. If you can see, their shooting percentage is at the top of the league at 12.3%. Um, it's inexplicably high. And, uh, you know, one of the guys I just looked at last week, Oliver Bjorkstrand, is shooting at 3%. So he's a guy who usually gets a ton of shots and could potentially be a goal scorer for them, and he, even he's not shooting that well. Um, so it's coming uh, for basically no reason right now. There's a bunch of talented players that are uh, playing on that power play, as we'll see in the next slide, but I don't expect this to necessarily continue for Seattle. Dallas, on the other hand, is taking a page out of Calgary's playbook from last year and riding an insanely top, hot top line uh, to really excellent uh, goals numbers right now. And even though there is a high shooting percentage and there you know, might be a possible uh, room for regression there. They haven't seen much turnover in the offseason. That top line is very familiar with one another. They're all very talented. And if you know anything about Pete DeBoer teams, they almost always make the finals in the first year that he's coaching them. Uh, you can go back and check this yourself. I've done the research on this, and this could potentially continue this year. So uh, Dallas, I wouldn't necessarily look at, at regressing. The, uh, at the other end of the graph, Carolina, as I mentioned before, has the worst shooting percentage in the league, and they are 16 goals below what they're expected to have given the, the quality of their chances. Now, this indicates to me that the Canes are bound to start scoring any day now. Last year, they were averaging 3.38 goals per game. This year, 2.68, and there's definitely been some turnover on the roster. They lost Trocek. They lost Niederreiter. They brought in Pacioretty, who hasn't played a game yet this season. Uh, but this is why I was high on Pacioretty in my last video about the top IR targets. Pacioretty will fill the void left by those two guys and will likely be a catalyst for the Canes offense and get them closer to three goals per game, which is where they need to be. Remember, they only gave up around 2.7 goals per game. So if they can get to three goals per game uh, you know, on offensively, they'll definitely be higher up in the Metro Division standings, in theory at least. Now, I mentioned Calgary just a minute ago. Calgary is the second worst on this chart, and I've been getting a ton of questions about Calgary, whether or not they can turn it around. Uh, and what I've been telling you guys is that Calgary had a lot of turnover in the offseason. Um, they brought in a bunch of good players, but they haven't found chemistry yet, and that's natural to expect after so many guys left and guys were brought into new roles. And then you add to that an unusually low shooting percentage, and you get a bunch of angry Huberto, Kadri, Mangiapane, and Lindholm owners. Uh, and I'm, I'm definitely hearing from those guys right now. Um, I do tend to believe in what the Flames have defensively, but last year they relied heavily on their top line, two-thirds of which is now gone. Um, last year they averaged 3.5 goals per game. Uh, this year they're at 2.85, and they're giving up 3.18. Uh, so their goal differential is pretty negative, and that's the most concerning factor. So what Calgary will have to do in order to have more success is both cut the goals against down to below three and also simultaneously increase the goals for above three, which is very difficult to do. So I wouldn't expect their shooting percentage to stay this low, but despite that, the Flames are only one to two goals below expected, so I don't necessarily see them breaking out offensively in the near future. If they're going to turn it around, it has to come from Jacob Markstrom, who's a sub-900 goalie right now. Now, one last thing to note uh, before we move on from this, is the Devils. They're all the way up here above the uh, average mark in terms of shooting percentage, um, but they're not way here at the top. They're not at the bottom. This likely indicates, like pretty much every other underlying metric that I've seen, that they are 100% capable of sustaining this dominance over the league. Uh, maybe not at this current ridiculous pace, but they absolutely will be a playoff team, unlike what Keith Yandel seems to think. 
Now, the only thing that they have to worry about is the injury bug, which they've stayed away from as they've rostered the exact same lineup for 15 straight games during the win streak. Um, that was a couple games ago, so they have had some injuries. Nathan Bastian, who was on their power play, is injured. Um, so Alex Holtz got a little bit of an opportunity there. You could potentially look at him off the waiver wire. Um, but this is another metric. These are, you know, team shooting percentages kind of shows you who's going to regress uh, back up or back down. Now, as we look at the last graph, this is a direct source where you can mine fantasy value the easiest. So these are the top power plays. And if a play, any player on one of these top power plays is available, go and grab them right now. Now, I always mention the guys on the waiver wire getting a lot of opportunities on a bad team or on a bad power play. Uh, and there is merit to finding those guys as well. But the easier thing to do would be to find a power play like Colorado and find a player on it who isn't fully owned up, say Arturi Lekkonen or Val Nichushkin, and try to target them on the wire or in a trade. So Lekkonen right now is Yahoo rank 80, only 72% owned for some reason. He has 17 points in 20 games, and 11 of those are on the power play this year. Uh, he's likely only there in shadow leagues, but if you're in a 6-10 to 10 team league, pay attention to this and try to grab him as soon as you can. Now, obviously a power play like Colorado... Uh, people are going to be on that really early. They'll probably have scooped up guys like Lekkonen in the first few weeks of the season. But some of these power plays are surprisingly good. And the discrepancy between what we think of normally and what the data is actually showing us is where you can find some value. So, for example, Buffalo and Seattle. Uh, in Buffalo, Dylan Cousins is currently getting power play one time, and he's only 22% owned. 8 goals, 10 assists, 23 games, and 2.69 shots per game as well. And you look at Buffalo's power play, they're at 26%. So he's more likely to score than a guy who's playing on Philadelphia's power play, for example. Uh, and then you also have Seattle, who I just mentioned. Almost every one of their guys is below 50% ownership. Uh, Burakovsky is the exception, 57% owned. He's got 9 power play points. Justin Schultz, 7 points on the power play, 26% owned. Vince Dunn, 6 power play points, 50% owned. Eberle, 6 power play points, 19% owned. And then the value play of the week right now. Daniel Sprong, 5 goals, 8 assists, 13 points, and 6 power play points in only 15 games. And he's 1% owned right now. So if he's on your wire, go stream him really quick before he, he starts to cool off. Now, another team that we wouldn't necessarily expect to have a good power play are the Islanders. And whoever thought of them as being a good offensive team, let alone having the 12th best power play in the league. Um, now, I've been beating the drum for Matt Barzell all year, including preseason. He currently has 26 points in 24 games, and 12 of those are on the power play. And he's only 71% owned. Um, Anders Lee, 8 goals, 11 assists, 8 power play points. He's 70% owned. Brock Nelson, now he's finally getting some ownership. I've been talking about him since preseason. 11 goals, 12 assists, 7 power play points. He's 67% owned. But you can also find J.G. Pajot on that top power play unit. 6 goals, 8 assists, 5 power play points, only 24% owned. So that's what I'm talking about. Finding a guy with low ownership on a really good power play, that could potentially be value for you. And J.G. Pajot has been showing up on a lot of our uh, weekly videos in terms of uh, power play production ads, goal scoring lately, um, and he's always a face-off menace as well. So th this is kind of how you can do it. Now, if you look at the other end of the spectrum, Chicago isn't as bad on the power play as they are in other areas. Uh, so you normally think of Chicago as a horrible team all around, but their power play is middle of the pack. And yet Max Domi, who is three position eligible, center, left wing, right wing, he's only 20% owned and he has seven goals, nine assists, and eight power play points on the year. So in deeper leagues with power play point weighting or power play points as a category, that could come in handy. But this is how you use the data to your advantage. Sometimes we like to think one thing and, you know, that thing in this case might have been the Islanders are all about defense. And then when you look at, at the data, you see that they're averaging 3.34 goals for per game, which is 0.55 more than last year. So half a goal a game better than they were last year. Um, sometimes we think a team like Carolina is a good place to pick forwards from in fantasy. Then you look at the data and see how awful their offense is playing and it kind of changes things. Now, you see Carolina's power play seventh worst in the league, 16.5%. And you look at, you know, what are the possible explanations for this? Then you see Tara Vinen on the IR along with Max, Max Pacioretty. You think about how Brent Burns is new on that power play unit and they lost Niederreiter and Trocek. And that could explain the slow start. 
and it can give you a roadmap for when they'll likely start to turn it around. Once they get some of these guys healthy and get some chemistry, their power play, their shooting percentage, and overall team offense will probably start to turn around a bit, and you can get out in front of those trends by grabbing those players now before all this happens. Now, Taravainen is still 66% owned for some reason, but Pacioretty is only 44% owned, and he has resumed skating, though he's probably about a month or so away, uh, as I mentioned in the IR targets video. But he's a guy with relatively low ownership that could potentially break this power play out of its funk, and you could get him now before everybody else is onto that file. And once again, if you want access to these charts and visualizations, you can click the Patreon link in the description below. For only $3 a month, you get all of the charts you saw in this video and probably many, many more. Um, I usually publish the charts before making the videos, so you actually get an advantage on everybody else in your league, even if they watch my channel. Uh, but if you want me to act as your personal fantasy hockey data analyst and help you through waiver moves, trade offers, etc., you can access our private Discord group for only $5 a month. And between myself and the data and the great group of guys we have in that chat, many of whom help me get valuable and timely info about other teams that I don't usually watch, uh, it is a great resource to give yourself that advantage. Now, if you're struggling in fantasy right now, let me and the Discord group help you get back into the playoff hunt before it's too late and you lose all your money. Uh, but that's going to do it for this video. If you watch through to the end, I want to thank you for that. It does help the channel. Uh, and what also helps the channel is if you can spread the word, Reddit, Facebook groups, group chats, wherever you get info about fantasy hockey, um, feel free to shout me out, leave a, a you know, a, a copy, a link or whatever, send, you know, share one of the, the videos that we have here. Also feel free to uh, follow me on Instagram at data underscore draft from some more daily updates. Um, I've been doing a little bit more daily fantasy and uh, betting option posts, um, trying to provide value to got to you guys, however I can, but this is going to do it for this video. Thank you again. And I will see you in the next one.